Good morning. We're going to kick off this morning's service with uh, song number 679. Just so sweet to trust in Jesus. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus said the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I Trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust him. Just to trust this living love, just in simple faith to touch me, meet the deep repenting heart. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you. Morning, church. Morning. Wonderful day, beautiful day. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> uh, I don't have any real uh, news 
uh, that needs to be brought, except uh, I did see something in the bulletin that really brought my attention. And that is Ken is having a birthday on the 5th of July. So from all of the congregation, we wish you a happy birthday because you're probably not going to see us. <laughs> also, uh, I would like to uh, pay tribute and thankfulness uh, for the men of the congregation uh, and, and that, that's serving uh, on us from, from Sunday to Sunday. I know that it uh, sometimes you feel like that I'm picking on you, but uh, there's not many of us. So sometimes I may ask you to have to do double duty. Uh, but I do appreciate all of you's willingness uh, to serve the Lord. If you be with me, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and so thankful for all the mercy that you show upon us. But Father, most of all, we are thankful for your Son who came to this earth and died on a cruel cross so that we might have remission of sin and a hope for eternal life. Father, we ask now that you will be with Ryan as he goes through the message today and that we worship you in song and prayer. Just be with him and let him say the things that uh, we take to our heart and that we can apply each and every day. Now, Father, we also pray for those who are sick, those who are suffering from pain, we are so thankful for it, Lord. We know you're the great physician and that you can heal. And Father, we ask now that you will be with them. Father, we ask these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. The text for uh, Ryan's sermon this morning is Second John. Uh, sorry, First John, chapter two, verses twenty-eight uh, and twenty-nine. And now, dear children, continue in Him, so that when He appears, we may be confident and unashamed before Him at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of Him. I care not today what the morrow may bring, his shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know will live forever with me, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith, living by in Jesus above. Trusting
Before we share in the Lord's communion, we'll be singing song number 364. Come share the Lord. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come drink the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Thank you. 
we give thanks for all that you do. Father, we have in mind the shepherd who allow us to thank you so very much when we were coming to this church to be sacrificed in your church. Father, let us never forget what we did and what you were doing. And with that in mind, Father, we will encourage and encourage you. Give us the leaders of our lives. Lord, dear and Father, we continue to do the very sacrifice that you need to come by your beloved. That you were willing to spend the living of your son, your father, to live the simple life of a mother, the perfect life. That's just something we try to follow. Save your life and fill with joy. The cross of your body was made up of the cross. I know that which we have to talk to the Lord and the God of the Lord is a simple problem and exactly what we want to talk about. It takes the majesty of that compassion of that, the love and wisdom of that. And we ask that you do this in what we see that you do. You glorify it in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Jesus' name.
this time we take a moment for Dominion Sykes to collect a contribution. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we are so grateful for your Son, for our opportunity for salvation, everlasting life. But we're grateful for the ongoing grace and mercy and opportunities that you provide to us. We ask that we each give back a portion of those blessings in whatever manner that is appropriate. Then, Heavenly Father, we, we understand that we're all different. We all profit from the blessings that you send us and the grace and the mercy you've extended us through your Son. We ask that we all search our hearts Touch our spirits and to be able to return a portion of those blessings so that your work on this earth, in this world, this mortal world, can be forwarded, can be done in a way that pleases you. We pray that your will be done. And we pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. Next, we're going to be singing song number 538, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ring of holy name on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy veil, I anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand.
And at this time, uh, our children are released to Children's Church as we sing Walking in Sunlight. Walking in sunlight on my journey over the mountains to the big trail. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that ever can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heaven Well, good morning to everyone here. Glad to see everybody here this morning for another beautiful day to come together and to be able to worship our great and glorious God. You know, with our sermon last week, um, there's a reason why the last two verses um, are separated uh, from that. For two reasons. We could have easily have just concluded it and help that become the anchor point uh, for what we talked about last week with the uh, warning of antichrists that John had put forth inside of his writing there. And then gone straight into chapter three this week. However, these last two verses of first John chapter two really need to be spoken of, not necessarily apart from that thought, but they're highlighted in such a way and the way in which it's written really is something to analyze in a sermon by itself. Why is that? Well, we just sang a couple of songs that talk about and help remind us of confidence and assurance that we have inside of our Lord and Savior. My hope is built on nothing less, and I'm walking 
in sunlight with him. Jesus is mine. We go through this life constantly with different struggles, with different tribulations, through different things that can hinder that from us. Sometimes we forget that Jesus is the one in whom we build upon our faith. Sometimes we forget that as we're walking, we forget that he's there walking beside us. They're giving us power, giving us confidence, giving us assurance, love, everything that the Lord bestows to us. So whenever John wrote these words in chapter 2 at the end of it, he again starts it over with that idea of little children. Little children, the very great phrase that John loves to use to help give reassurance to his readers. Abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Well, John, what exactly are you talking about here? And exactly where are we going at with this sermon here? Well, it's a little bit of a difficulty that Christians in the first age had and Christians today have. Confidence of Jesus Christ and his return back here to gather us back. Now, it's not confidence whether or not he's going to keep his promise or not. I think just about everyone in here is reassured and knows Jesus will come back. But if he did come back, what is your confidence at meeting the Lord? Sometimes that is where we struggle with inside of our lives. And that's maybe the question that I'd like to try to help answer with us here this morning. Are you timid about Jesus returning back to this earth? The time is coming when we all will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back. God has ordained Christ to be judge of the world. That's something that's been given throughout the entirety of the book of John. And a little bit of what Jesus, or not Jesus, what Paul was saying about Jesus on his sermon on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. He has now made this man Lord, judge, and ruler over all. Therefore, we are all going to appear before Jesus Christ. Many people, if they think about the day of judgment at all, do so with a lot of apprehension. For some, it's probably a good reason for they know their lives are not right with God. I can't get, I can't stand there in front of him because he knows that I've been wrong and have not been doing right. But there are some who fear the coming of the day who really shouldn't, who can look at that forward to that day, knowing that they will stand before him with great boldness, confidence, and reassurance. The last two songs that we spoke of, did we put that into our hearts. You know, one of the great passages that are used in Ephesians and Colossians tell us that we are not only singing with our hearts these hymns, but we're teaching and admonishing one another with those hymns. Do you have that confidence that Jesus is your rock? Do you have that confidence that Jesus is the light in which you are walking in? If you are, well, maybe the sermon really isn't for you. Maybe it's just a good reminder. But if not, how can we turn our outlook of the day in which he is coming back, instead of it being a terrible day, being a day of triumph? John wrote his first epistle with the desire to help his readers understand that they can have confidence before the Lord when he returns. So what was John's goal for his little children? Well, there's two things that are said there in verse 28. First one there is to have confidence when Christ appears. Now, the word for confidence is parousia, and it means all outspokenness, frankness, bluntness, often publicly, and by implication is assurance, boldness, and confidence. 
Elsewhere in the scriptures, this word is used to give a couple of examples. Was the boldness of Peter and John before the council, uh, the Sanhedrin council in Acts chapter 8 and verse 13, the testimony that they gave there. And the boldness of Paul's preaching in Damascus after he was converted in Acts chapter 9 and verse 27. That in and of itself shows that these apostles, teachers, the one in whom John is writing to here, if you've tasted and have seen how great the Lord is in your life, that confidence will be exuberated as you continue to work out that faith that you have inside of him to be able to know and to be able to give that to other people. That's where confidence comes for. Because even now in Christ, we have boldness and access with confidence to God because of Jesus Christ. Bold access to the throne of God for mercy and for grace, for help in Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, it's John's goal that we have that same sort of boldness and confidence at Christ's appearing that we have now. Just as we can now boldly approach God's throne of grace, so we can then stand with confidence before Christ's throne of judgment. He also asks for his readers to not be ashamed. And the word here is exunami, which is from a word is asios. It's used to describe disfigurement or disgrace, to feel shame for oneself or to be ashamed. And it's used to describe in some passages like Luke 16, 3, the unjust steward's attitude toward banking. He felt shame in having to do that because he was being released from his master service and didn't want to have to go about and start begging favors of people. One of the big phrases that has always been said about, it's to the point of trying to get people to be faithful inside of attending the assembly on Sunday mornings. Uh, what if Jesus came back right now? Wouldn't you rather be caught with the people worshiping God rather than being caught at the lake or doing something else, something else that could take up your time? This is kind of the idea of what we're going through here with this. Have confidence in him, but also not to be ashamed. I think a better way to be able to help say that phrase is if the Lord was to return, wouldn't you rather be caught by him doing his work rather than not doing his work? To be ashamed, therefore, is the opposite of being bold and confident. You can't be ashamed and therefore be confident. You can't be confident if you're ashamed. John does not want, to be, uh, want us to be ashamed of ourselves when Jesus Christ comes again. To stand before Jesus at his coming with confidence and no shame, that is John's goal for his little children. Is that not all the goal that we want for ourselves? That blessed assurance that we have, knowing that we have been a faithful worker, producing much fruit before him, to know that we have confidence and assurance in him? It's a great goal. Oftentimes, when we compare ourselves, though, to the church of the first century, to what we have here now, we often think, wow, well, they probably had it easier. They had the Spirit guiding them. They had the apostles still there with them. They had the assurance just a little bit more closer to them because some of them may have even got to interact with Christ. But this is not a lofty goal, and this is not a goal out of reach. In fact, it is something that we can still accomplish here today. It is something that, as John asked his little children whenever he wrote the letter, we also too can apply it into our lives today. Because the solution for obtaining that goal is the same as it was in the first century. Abide in him. That's the thing that he said there at the beginning. Abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Well, here's the key to having confidence in Christ's appearing. That is the answer if we do not want to be ashamed at his coming. But how does one abide in Christ? And I think that is the way in which we can help answer our initial question. How can we not be timid at his reappearing? Well, are we fully abiding in him? Has our confidence really driven that into knowing that we are 
inside of the Lord. So abiding in Christ. Well, a little bit of this could very easily go into abiding in his word. That was something that John put as a reassurance whenever he was talking about Antichrist coming into the world in verse 24. Therefore, let that abide in you, which you heard from the, from the beginning. If that you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. If you remember over in the great prelude to the Gospel of John, Jesus being the Word came into the flesh. So they end up having a twofold experience with us. You can both abide in the Lord by putting Him on in baptism, and you can abide in the Word by having it put upon you as well through your relationship in Jesus. That was something that was even explained to Jesus himself over in John chapter 14 and chapter 15. Letting his word in us, therefore, includes two important concepts, that we know his word and that we keep his word. Now, I'm persuaded that the lack of confidence of many Christians have is the result of not knowing the words of Jesus. It's akin to the apprehension, maybe a lot feel whenever they're about to take a test. Not having properly studied the material, naturally not knowing it very well because there has not been any studying. Going into the desk, there's a lingering idea that I'm going to fail. Whereas one who has diligently studied has confidence going into the test and knows that they will pass. That's one of the things to be able to help get around the idea of confidence. How much do you truly allow the word of God abide in you? When brethren do not read and study God's word, the Bible, it's understanding why they would be apprehensive by being judged by it. The solution, therefore, is to know God's word, the words of Jesus. And it's a simple one and a great place to start whenever we're talking about being confident in the Lord. But I didn't want to talk a whole lot about study. One of the greater things that's inside of that, which is the second concept, is keeping his word. You can know the Bible all day long, but that still may not give you any kind of confidence if you don't put it into practice. Very much is biblical wisdom whenever one studies, sees it acting in life, it produces some kind of wisdom or patience inside of it, knowing what God has done beforehand, is doing for us now, and will do for us is exactly what we can have confidence in the word of God and what he does for us today. Because it's not enough, though, to just know the word. We have to keep it. We need to be doers of the word. Go over to James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. I know quite a bit of us do uh, different uh, Bible translations in our sermons and in study. And I'm actually going to do that with a couple of these longer passages here, uh, because that's usually what I do whenever I'm preparing for a lesson, is I usually go through about five different versions of the Bible to get the full encompassment of what the thought is supposed to be. So if you have it there with you in James chapter 1, you can follow along with me in your version, but I'm actually going to be reading this from the Christian Standard Bible. My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. You know, I've always heard that being a separate thought here in James chapter 1, but it gets the full encompassment of what James is trying to say here in this passage of Scripture. He's saying being a little bit patient. Be slow to react. Have the idea to think, then to act. Because if we try to do it on our own, such as trying to do and produce anger in a situation, it's not going to accomplish any of God's righteousness. 
Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. The idea there of implementation of the word had to be put there inside of your heart, which means you had to have learned it. You had to have studied it. You had to have put it into your life. Know it because it saves your souls. And that's a great thing to be able to know about the gospel and the study of the word of God. It does help save your soul. But James doesn't end it right there. He says, you know that, but he puts it just a little bit more forward. And that's the idea of what we're getting here in 1 John chapter 2. But be doers of the word and not hearers, only deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and preserves it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless. He deceives himself. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distresses and to keep oneself unstained from the world. That's the way in which John is trying to help put forth the thought to us here in verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, talking about whom Jesus is, you've heard about him, you studied about him, you have a relationship with him. If you know he is righteous, by the way in which you've studied his life, his example, his teachings, you know that everyone who practices righteousness, just as Jesus was righteous, is born of him. Not only was that a sign to be able to help keep away from some of the false teachers that were there prevalent in John's time, but it was also a sign to be able to show whom truly is the Lord's. Do you practice righteousness? Are you a doer of the word or a hearer only? We can come in. We could have the greatest gospel preacher standing before you here today. I never boast of myself. I always know I need room for improvement. There's several more different people. There are much more better preachers than I am. Could be up here and give a rousing sermon three, four hours, keep your attention the entire time. But if we don't put into practice on what is spoken about, then what was the point? We've got to put into ourselves what is said and not just hearing it only. Only he who practices righteousness is truly born of God and abiding in Jesus because they patter themselves after him. It gives to that entire idea of not only are we trying to allow the Lord abide in us by diligently knowing whom he is and perfecting our relationship of him, but discipling ourselves after that. Christianity to me has always been the biggest game of monkey see, monkey do. Jesus did such, I should do such. Jesus did and acted as, I should also want to act and do as he did. One of the greatest things that not only did John himself talk about here in this section, but Paul also wrote about this. We talked about this a little bit on our Wednesday night class. So go over to Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to read the first half of the passage there. So we saw over in James how important it is to be a doer of the word. And James gives a couple of examples there. One of the great ways to be able to help work your religion, so to speak, is to be able to care for widows and orphans and their afflictions, and be able to go out and keep yourself unspotted of the world. Paul opens that thought up so much more for us in Philippians chapter 2 because of what he says in verses 1 through 18. A little bit of a lengthy passage here, and again, I'm going to be reading it through the Christian Standard Bible here. 
follow along with me and note the flavor of what Paul, John, through the teaching and through the giving of the Spirit, is trying to put forth to us with the idea of practicing after righteousness and having confidence and not being ashamed of doing what the Lord has asked. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider yourselves as more important than yourselves. Others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted and gave him the name that is above every name, so that all will bow at the name of Jesus in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's that great enactor word, that connector phrase Paul always loves to use. Therefore, my dear friends, just if you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world by her holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you in the same way you should be glad and rejoice with me. How beautiful it is to see where it goes to playing the ultimate game, monkey see, monkey do. Be as a servant, as is Jesus was. The comparison that is given there, I said this on Wednesday night, I have absolutely no idea, nor could I comprehend what it truly meant for Jesus to be on equal terms as God and gave that up to take the form of a servant. But what he has asked is to mimic that. Take away from self. Take away from the idea of identity of what I want to do of my own good pleasure. Empty that out and therefore imitate the service of what Jesus did, even to the point of death. What happened to Jesus because of that? He has a rich reward that is granted to him. A rich reward is granted to those that are inside of that same abiding of the word, of being a servant follower, a disciple of Jesus. But if you know what Jesus taught, it's not at all very hard to do what he says. In chapter 5 and verse 3 of 1 John, he says this, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commands, and his commandments were not burdensome. That echoes the thought that is given over in Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. You know, the last portion of this scripture is often quoted and while this isn't the full thought in the context of it, it does give a great idea as to what Jesus is asking upon us. 
this day and age. And actually a little bit of the bulletin article um, this week was inspired because of this scripture. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Because that has taken place, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus wants to be with us yoked together with us to go through this life. He is there with us, for us, working side by side with us. But if we're pulling whenever he's going to the right and we're pulling off to the left, there's going to be turmoil and there's going to be conflict. There's going to be hurt in our lives. There's going to be times in which whenever we think we're doing as the Lord wills, and then it comes to fruition that that wasn't the case. What is it that we are trying to help accomplish by being disciples of the Lord? Add all these thoughts together. In addition to what John has already talked about in the beginning of this letter in chapter 1, the continual cleansing power of Jesus Christ's blood, if we come before him, confessing of our faults when we sin, we have every assurance possible to be confident with our Lord. So the question is reiterated again. Are you timid about the return of the Lord? Well, do you know Jesus? In practice, as if you're discipling yourself as Jesus living in you, Galatians 2.20. How do we have confidence and assurance of the Lord returning back here today to take us back to an eternal place, one that he said will have great rest? It's by being a great laborer in his field by being one that is allowing him to direct us, to show us where he would want us to pattern our lives after him and to do the Father's good will. If you haven't been doing that, then I can see where the timidity could come from. I've had that before in my life, as does every person that walks here on this earth. We know that there are things we should do, and yet we don't do it. An example of that actually happened very recent, actually last week. A gentleman was walking out of uh, Walmart. This was over in a different town. We were dropping off Sophia. And we stopped by there. I always like to take a little trip, go shop a little bit after, after we're getting her together. And a gentleman came out of uh, the parking lot looking around had a bag of chips in his hand. Sir, can you spare some food? Hungry, you know, I don't want to make it inconvenient on you or anything, but I'm, I'm hungry, I need some help. In my head, I had the conversation of, okay, you got a bag of chips, how hungry are you? It took me all of two seconds to think that's not what Jesus would have wanted. He was surprised that the next thing that happened Come with me into the store. What? Come with me. You're hungry? Let's go get you some food. Come on. What has a blessing of $10 of luncheon meat and a loaf of bread done to anything else than what God has already richly bestowed upon me? Absolutely nothing. He called us to be servants. Went and got the stuff for him. 
left it with him, gave him some contact information, prayed with him for just some relief of whatever his trial was, that he'd be able to get back into work. We went on our way. What did something like that do help show and emulate Christ to that person rather than walking away and saying, no, thank you? One of the things that James also talks about, about working in faith, is in chapter 2. I don't have it on here on our PowerPoint. And it was going to be just the closing thoughts of our uh, sermon here today. If I can get over to it. <clears throat> verse 14, down into verse 26 of James 2, it says this. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was, the scripture was uh, fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. The more we know and the more we keep the words of our Lord, the greater our confidence that we shall stand before our Lord on that great day of judgment with all boldness. There are so many things, and it's, I guess, controversial to say this. I would rather give up more opportunities to teach the word if that meant that there are more opportunities to go and to serve. We come together on the first day of the week to be able to, yes, worship our Lord, to be able to have fellowship with one another, to be able to share and partake, to commune. I'd give up all the Bible classes in the world if that meant we could go out into the world and help out those that were needing it. As John says, abide in him which we've seen occurs when we follow his earlier admonitions. In chapter 2, we are reminded of what it means to disciple ourselves after Jesus. Know by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. But he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. In chapter 2, 24, Therefore let that abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. Are you letting the word of God abide in you so that you are truly abiding in the Son and the Father? Do you know and keep as if Jesus were living through you here today. I appreciate and want to reiterate what Brother Cullen said earlier in the announcements. We're so very thankful for all those that serve publicly inside of the worship assemblies. All the men that step up and are able to do all these great things so that we may be able to come together and be able to worship our Lord. But there are other things that we need help with as well. 
Next Sunday, we will be resuming the Wesley House nursing home worship, and that's starting at nine. We've been going to town hall for the last two or three weeks at 8.30. And Homestead's been going since March. And besides the few occasions of one or two people, I've been doing that by myself and have not gone in the last three weeks. We have benevolence opportunities in this area. HIM needs volunteers. We have people that are needing and clamoring inside of our community after our community day that we had at the beginning of June, opportunities in which we can go out and to be able to set forth our ideas into the community, to be able to show and entreat people to come in, to be part of this great family. I can't answer the question for you, are you timid of Jesus's return? I can only put forth to you where confidence can come from and we're not being ashamed of him is. If you are confident and not ashamed, bless you and you keep on doing what you're doing. If you are working and you're diligently being a servant of the Lord, do it. But if you know there's a little bit more than what you can do, we have plenty of opportunities in which we can serve. We'd like to entreat you as part of the invitation here this morning. If you'd like to know more about these opportunities to go out and to be servants in the community, we'd like to be able to invite you to do that. If there's something that you know that you can be able to help take part in here, we'd love to be able to entreat you with that as well. Or maybe you need a little bit of guidance here to disciple yourself by way of study of the word and practicing of the word. We'd like to be able to entreat you with that as well. In fact, after small groups finishes up, Deborah and I have been talking about this and although we'll be resuming our Sunday night services on August the 8th, uh, Deborah and I didn't want to have the missing part of fellowshipping with one another and to be able to continue along this idea of getting together and encouraging each other during the week. So we haven't set forth a time or a, a place to get it started, but we want to open up our home and the opportunity for you to come and have breakfast with us on some mornings, get together to do a little study, a little prayer, and just to continue to keep that momentum going of knowing what it means to serving and discipling, encouraging and edifying one another as we make our walk through this earth. So if there's anyone that's subject to the invitation here this morning, let it be known as we stand and sing our song of encouragement.
to carry the message with us as we go. Help us to uh, be in the community and see those in the community that uh, need thy guidance and to help, hopefully, that, Father, we can be a witness to them and, Father, that we can uh, make them, encourage them that they uh, could come and join our, our service here. Father, be with the leaders of the nation and guide them and direct them and help us, Father, as we go through our daily lives that uh, together that we can work together and get this uh, pandemic uh, under control and stop the spread of the, the virus. And go with us, Father, and, and, and guide us and direct us and until we can come to the next uh, appointed uh, service. Watch over us and guide us and keep us safe. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.